Good afternoon to all our participants. Thank you for joining us uh, this afternoon and perhaps in the morning from where you are. Uh, you know, we've got a fantastic lineup of speakers this afternoon, and I'm going to jump straight in to introduce them to you. Our first speaker is Ms. Prampreya uh, Lundberg. She is the policy specialist at the Office of the National Higher Education Science, Research and Innovation Policy Council in Bangkok, Thailand. She's an official contact point of Thailand for the Committee of Scientific and Technological Policy of OECD. She has also been on secondment as an assistant to the Minister of Science and Technology and the Minister of Edu Higher Education, Science, Research and Innovation. Pramperia has published several articles in academic journals, given lectures in both academic and industrial settings. Um, she has supervised more than 20 students in the master's degree level within subjects ranging from industrial dynamics to innovation management and has represented Thailand in a variety of international committees, such as the OECD CSTP and the UNESCO CICT STI. Um, Prampriya holds a PhD in Industrial Economics and Management from KTH Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm, Sweden. Her research analysis analyzes sorry, the diffusion of innovation, primarily on the use of renewable energy technologies to alleviate poverty. While doing her PhD, she was the first and the only PhD candidate who was invited and elected as a member of the International Association for Management of Technology Board of Directors. So Prampriya, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Our next speaker is Ms. Agata Zabrowska. She is the Chief Operating Officer for Conception X. You know, her mission is to support aspiring entrepreneurs and businesses in their pursuit of success. As a COO at Conception X, she helps people achieve their goals through the program. Um, she founded and launched well, one company, multiple educational and community projects, including Lean in Portugal, Lisbon's 3K Strong Community of Entrepreneurial Women, and um, supported women entrepreneurs through London's Female Founders Accelerator. For the past 15 years, Agatha has worked in program, accounts, and partnerships management in Europe, uh, as well as in Malaysia. So thank you for joining us as well, Agatha, to be our speaker this afternoon. Let me introduce then our next speaker is uh, Mr. Adam Coral. General Manager Asia for Australasian Premium Partners based in Vietnam. He's an Australian cross-industry business development professional who has called Vietnam home for 20 years. If you look at his backdrop later, it is the city of Ho Chi Minh. He's a managing partner and director of operations for Australasian Premium Partners, a consulting firm which specializes in services related to trade and investment between Vietnam and Australia. Adam is responsible for evaluating and strategizing planning for market entry and also implements supply chain processes, delivery systems and sales channels for Australian and Vietnamese businesses. Adam brings with him experience working in Australia, South Africa, England, Japan and Vietnam. He holds a degree in horticulture from Melbourne University uh, master's in education from UTS. I think he really enjoys studying because he has a postgraduate diploma in business management. And he is my senior in a master's in global trade from RMIT in Vietnam. So Adam, thank you for joining us. Welcome to our last session. Our next speaker, very interesting speaker, Ms. Yukako Idehara. She is the planning and coordinating manager from IRIA. Um, she's been with IRIA since August 2020. Before being transferred to IRIA, she worked as an international sales planner at All Nippon Airways, earned a Bachelor's of Law Politics degree from the KEIO University in Tokyo. While she was a university student, she led the KEIO lacrosse team to the national championships as a captain in 2030 
and also led the Japan national team in the Lacrosse World Cup. She has newly established Indonesia Lacrosse Federation in Jakarta in April and has already organized a couple of clinics and workshops for the local children aiming to develop lacrosse in Indonesia for the Olympics in 2028. And she is keen on pursuing you know, the opportunities for leadership education. Um, over a year tenure, tenure in ERIA, she initiated the 2021 ERIA YNG Social Impact Idea Competition. This program has sought international young talents contributing to address social and economic challenges in the midst of this pandemic. Yukako-san, thank you for joining us. And our final speaker is Ms. Ji Yun Chung, the Chief Executive Officer from CODIT, Republic of Korea. She co-founded CODIT, an AI regulation and policy monitoring platform that helps companies monitor legal, legislative, regulatory, policy information at government, local, city, and district level. Public policy managers, legal counsels, PR managers use the coded solution to quickly monitor risk as well as find opportunities from the central and local governments and agencies. She is very active in engaging the government on several committees, such as the Youth Policy Coordination Committee under the Prime Minister's office, as well as the Data-Driven Public Policy Making Committee under the Ministry of Science and ICT. Prior to starting her own business, Ji Yoon spent almost a decade in the OECD and UNESCO as a policy analyst, focusing on education-related research, policy, projects, and programs. She studied public policy at graduate school at Seoul National University and economics from Royal Holloway. University of London. So our participants, you know, we are presenting to you really a very interesting lineup of speakers this afternoon. And without further ado, I'm going to jump straight into our conversation for this afternoon. Um, and you know, our first question for for this afternoon um, goes to Prampriya. You know, Prampriya, um, I've introduced you a little bit but I think the participants want to hear from you. Can you share with us some of the you know, um, initiatives that the Office of Higher Education, Science Research and Innovation Policy Council, the initiatives that they have to support innovation and entrepreneurship in Thailand? Over to you, Prankriya. Thank you very much, TJ, and thank you for the introduction as well. Well, just to give you a background about Thailand, um, we have a goal to become an innovation-driven economy. The government has set the target to increase R&D expenditures from about 1.1% to reach 2% of the overall GDP by 2027. And out of this number, the aim is to have 30% of the R&D expenditures from public sector and 70% from private sector. Our office, next poll, we are working on initiatives in establishing ecosystem to encourage research and innovation activities in the private sector so that we can increase the number of innovation-driven enterprises. We have done an analysis and there are a number of issues uh, that we are considering. Um, first of all, we have recognized the need to promote entrepreneurs and innovation-driven businesses, particularly those in the small scales like smart SMEs, uh, startups and spin-offs from research institutes. Uh, we also recognize that there must be demand for innovation. So the government is working with mark new market stimulations and we also encourage open and inclusive innovation that can help solving societal problems. Um, and in order to do business, to, to promote business, we realize that risk should be reduced so that entrepreneurs feel safe to take on board new ideas and new products. This can be done in the form of seed fund, soft loans, venture capital, or angels. We also need to create financial privileges and incentives for in entrepreneurs to invest in innovation. So we provide tax incentives and an innovation fund. 
um, in Thailand, we have some red tapes uh, that we get uh, that we that we get feedback from the entrepreneurs. So we are also working on removing red tapes to unlock rules and regulations, so that it will be easier for for firms and more uh, beneficial for them to do research and innovation. And the, uh, my last. Uh, um, the last, the, my, my last point is that we are restructuring the support and management systems. So our ministry is relatively new. Uh, our ministry was founded in 2019 uh, by merging the higher education previously belonged under the Ministry of Education with the former Ministry of Science and Technology to become the new Ministry of Higher Education, Science, Research and Innovation. It's a very long name, I admit. And this merge facilitates collaboration among universities, public agencies, and research institutes. So with this in mind, we have developed and implemented a number of mechanisms with other organizations in the research development and innovation system. For example, we have been involved in the establishment of regional science parks. Uh, the regional science parks, they support collaboration between local entrepreneurs and researchers. We have also introduced 300% tax exemption for companies that perform research development and innovation activities. We have promoted a talent mobility program to allow movement of researchers from public agencies and universities to work in private sector. Um, our office has also performed in-depth system research on the promotion of innovation-based entrepreneurs in order to design and test new system and mechanisms to drive innovation. And based on the study, uh, we have made recommendations in three areas in finance, manpower, and infrastructure. For example, the recommendations on finance suggest to introduce measures like tax audit exemption and eligibility for the government's financial assistance to encourage innovation-based business to register to pay tax. It's also suggests to expand the scope of R&D tax incentive to cover marketing innovation, which was not eligible for tax incentive before. Um, for the recommendation on manpower, it suggests to relax rules to allow government scholars that are bound by contracts with the public sector to work in the private sector. This is because in Thailand, we have many academics that received scholarship to study abroad. And then after graduation, they need to come back to work in the public sector or universities in Thailand. So when they are allowed to work in private sector, it facilitates brain circulation. And this we call the talent mobility program. Um, for the recommendations on national quality infrastructure, it encourages relevant agencies to develop a roadmap and identify focus sectors in order to, to support Thai industry. Um, as you can see, we have a number of measures in place and we are not stopping here. We are still working on adjusting, expanding and finding the most appropriate measures that can help motivating entrepreneurs to innovate and benefit from their innovation activities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Frankria. Uh, so finance, manpower, infrastructure. Um, I, I like the concept of the talent mobility program because I think especially for local enterprises, having this talent is very important you know, to, to really supplement uh, and help them in their whole innovation journey. So yeah. very interesting start to our conversation. You know, let me move on to Agatha. Um, thank you for joining us early in the morning. You know, uh, and why don't you share with us a little bit more about the work that is being undertaken uh, by Conception X and its importance in fostering the next generation of entrepreneurs and innovators. Over to you, Agatha. Thank you. Um, and uh, uh, thanks to Fran Preya for uh, opening it up for us today. Um, great to hear uh, you're a PhD yourself. And uh, that's the work we do here at Conception X. Um, so what is Conception X? Um, it is a venture builder helping PhD students commercialize their research. Um, at the moment, we're based in the UK and supporting students across the UK. Uh, though, interestingly, many of them are actually international students and then going back home to foster innovation further uh, abroad. Um, so. We work with the brightest people um, and helping them uh, go from the lab to startup. Um, currently, we're working with uh, 30 universities across the UK. Um, and the students uh, we get to connect on a daily basis are our 
are truly incredible innovators themselves. Um, what's unique about our program, uh, because there are many incubators and accelerators out there, is that uh, students are uh, joining the program during their PhD, so uh, alongside their PhD, which makes uh, the university the incubator. And they're still using university resources, they're still in their PhD, they're still doing their research, but what they're looking at is, is there an opportunity to commercialize uh, what they're working on? And many of them are working on truly world-changing technologies. Um, most of it is AI, ML, blockchain, IoT. Uh, we get some hardware, uh, so robotics, also genetics. So it's a very broad definition of what uh, deep tech means. But what's really interesting about our work, and we have been um, uh, in existence since 2018 when Riam comes, our CEO, set up Conception X, is that every year we connect with more students and every year more students join our program which just sure it just shows um, that universities are truly the incubators of innovation and we really need to foster that um, you get different attitudes at universities um, so some of them are very supportive uh, in terms of entrepreneurship and, and helping students on their journey while others are a little bit more restricted in their thinking and perhaps you know, they want to keep students uh, in, in academia. The reality is, um, and if I'm, if I'm correct, that I think only half a percent of PhD students actually end up working in academia when they finish their degree. Um, but what I wanted to, to mention here is also the fact that because uh, these are PhD students, um, their research, um, you know, spreads over three, four, five years. It's in depth. Um, and the potential is absolutely huge. Um, so what do we help students with? Um, we basically help them gain business skills and more commercial mindset to look at their work uh, from a different point of view. Um, they often, when they come to us, they, they, they're not fully... Um, I think the appreciation for what it means to build a startup isn't necessarily there yet. They learn about finance. We have to change their mindset about finance. They learn about the customer, that the work that they're doing is really important, but there needs to be someone at the end uh, who will use the technology they have built. And then also that they need a team. So we are sort of um, the, the, the middlemen, so to say, uh, between the world of academia and the startups and uh, empowering students to, to create uh, fantastic um, companies. Uh, to date, we have worked with 160 PhD students over four cohorts, and we're now about to launch our fifth cohort. Uh, these teams are, as I mentioned, very, very early stage, but they have already raised 15 million. And they're working on, uh, just to give you a few examples, uh, for uh, one of the teams, I think from cohort two or three, um, basically developed an algorithm that helps detect uh, diseases such as dementia from MRI scans. Um, we have a student on cohort four, which just finished, who created uh, socks, um, which basically uh, help manage anxiety in people with uh, dementia. So two health tech examples. Um, then we have uh, uh, another student who developed a, a hugging robot, which basically can give you a hug that adapted to your height, uh, your size uh, and, and your needs too. Um, we have students who have developed a new type of wind turbine, um, which could potentially save millions and make a wind energy available uh, to many more destinations than, than where it uh, exists now. So it's truly amazing in terms of what, what students we are working with are building, but it wouldn't happen without some help um, because they're, they're very early uh, on their journey and their understanding of what market needs, how to commercialize it, how can I make it a success? Because uh, it's great that they're developing something amazing, but uh, at the end, you know, there needs to be a customer who will pay for it. Um, the last thing I want to say here is that um, 
what is really, really important in our work is that we, we, uh, we work very closely with universities. Um, without um, many people who are uh, the innovation managers, the on ent enterprise managers, um, or just heads of departments, um, our work wouldn't be possible. So the mindset of university staff is really, really important here because without them, uh, we just wouldn't get simply, we wouldn't get the access to, to PhDs. And PhDs also need, a supp need support because they're working on their degree while building a startup. Um, so I'll just, just leave everyone with that thought of, of university being the incubator. And uh, I look forward to further discussions and hearing from the rest of uh, panelists today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Agata. Um, very important work being the bridge builder to help the ideas you know, come to life and to help the students you know, be able to get the necessary skills and mindsets to be able to succeed. Uh, very interesting. Uh, I'll move on to our next speaker, Adam. You know, Adam, uh, you're based in Vietnam. You have seen, I guess, many, many, many worlds. Yeah? Uh, but share with us a little bit about the work you're doing over there and also your observations so far uh, in terms of the entrepreneurial spirit, the startup culture between Vietnam and perhaps Australia. The floor is yours, Adam. Thanks, PJ. Yeah, um, regards to myself. So, yeah, I've been in Vietnam around 20 years now. I'm from Australia. I, I, I focused on I focus on sustainable trade and investment across industries and mainly between Vietnam and Australia and sometimes some other countries in a wide, wide range of trade and investment based services and roles, you know, cutting across import, export, distribution, product ownership, product development company re representation and, and consultancy. And as, as Vietnam has developed and grown, I've had to adapt, learn and grow very quickly myself. So as an example, the, in the early market trade-based sort of era, you know, I focused on import export and it was an exciting space to be in up to around 2014. And, and then as the market developed, it became essential to provide more business development expertise with products to ensure the products could compete as more competition entered the market. And around the same time, you know, Vietnam's purchasing price parity was obviously becoming stronger and the market demands began changing with this too. And in the last few years, the appetite for investment to vertically integrate Vietnamese supply or service chains with Australia has been growing to establish a more bilateral economies of scales within some of the companies I've been involved in helping. And, and that's really, really interesting type of work and something I really enjoy. So yeah, I've, I've been fortunate enough to work across industries with technology and capability transfer from agriculture, education, you know, fast moving consumer goods, investment in upstream assets, assets property and construction projects, high quality commodities, with value add production of fish efficiencies. So yeah, just a, a whole range of areas pretty much. Um, an area that's important in all these farm bilateral business activities is with technology and capability transfers. And, and, and this is where the SMEs and startups can go international much faster than industry-based economic models would have expected even 10 years ago. So, so by this, I, I, I mean, you see a lot more startups from other countries entering Vietnam and this region very quickly. And in the past, that was very difficult to do, but it's actually possible to do now. And yeah, so um, I guess back to me, what do I do? So one way to describe what I do is I, I need to identify and know where the herd is, but not always run with the herd. Um, my role is knowing when and how to move or wait so opportunities are implemented the right way and not too early or too late. So they are mutually beneficial for all parties because if they're not good for everyone, then it, it just won't be sustainable. Um, so the second part of your question, I think it was about entrepreneurship observations. So you know, the 20 year journey with Vietnamese clients for me then who have become wonderful friends and partners, you know, it has made me a, a better person on, on so many levels. And, I say this because um, in Vietnam, there's a real respect for different perspectives. And P 
people put themselves out there to learn and grow and have an in, in, inquisitiveness and interest in how to develop their, their local environments. So, and, and this is what I love about broader ASEAN, you know, the ambition to develop and grow and adapt what's available into new local business models. And I, I really think we're gonna see a lot of new business models come out of this region. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so um, I, 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 I guess too, maybe some of the, the difficulties for the foreign companies I work with, um, looking at it, it's not so much, um, is, is in that so much of the value and uniqueness um, in Vietnam is inside the people and their local networks. So it's complicated to access, to understand, and it's complicated to mimic. And this is why Vietnam, and I think more broadly developing Asian nations will achieve wonderful innovation um, outcomes during our lifetimes. You know, they're not bound by a, um, a, a mature economic nation mindset, if that makes sense. And, and by finding localized modernization solutions, can really define what innovation and entrepreneurship means to them and what models fit them, which I think is very important. Yeah, so from all this, the startup community here demonstrates, I think, the key personal traits needed to get through chasms because there will be chasms. You know, they have the passion, the conviction, and the network engagement, which is essential. And although COVID has had devastating effects socially and economically across the world, it's also further fast-tracked localised innovation, which can become regional and but hopefully um, more broadly international disruptors. And a lot of this has been driven, I, I think, by ASEAN-focused companies who are either transforming developed market models or creating their own for those um, real localised population contextual needs. So it's about localising everything. Um, and only the last three or so years, like the adoption of agri and logistics tech has been really, really exciting in this part of the world. E-commerce, which is well written about FinTech, um, consumer integrated ecosystems, which you know I first noticed in Indonesia and, and it's come from there to Vietnam and, and so forth. Um, what are some other ones? Uh, oh, 20% growth in F&B speciality stores and healthcare is something that's it can be hard to visualize when I'm talking to people in developed countries, 20% growth in small specialized shops, which it's just amazing really. So if a startup can find a way to vertically integrate the fragmented parts of an industry in an environmentally friendly, positive way to help the end user's life be better, that's a value proposition that anyone would get behind. And it's something I put a lot of time in away from my everyday workflow to try to understand. Yeah, so just the final point. So observationally, there's a real talent to modify existing products or business models. So service and products are more accessible and affordable to lower income users. users. And this is very hard for international companies to do in this part of the world. And it really local, local, localizes the innovation and it's really complicated to mimic and I just find it extraordinary because it can be upscaled quickly to help millions of people and to have really, really new and positive life experiences. Yeah, so it's an exciting place to be, TJ. Okay, thanks so much. Thanks so much, Adam. Yeah, um, I, I, hear, I hear a few points, you know, like the ambition, the desire to learn and to grow, yeah, to, to really just absorb. Um, and also for people who are looking at coming into the country, um, the need to understand the local culture, modify to suit the local needs. Uh, so thanks very much for sharing, sharing those thoughts. Let me move on to uh, Yukako-san. You know, Yukako-san, prior to joining IRIA, you were an international athlete, leading the Japanese national team in the lacrosse World Cup. You are a Olympiad. No. Um, and also, you know, you've been involved in many international surfing competitions. Um, I guess through all these, um, what skills have you learned and how have they been useful for you, you know, in your professional career? If you could just share some thoughts with us. Thank you, TJ, for your question. 
So in a nutshell, I think I can say the skill that I learned was leadership, but I understand that leadership is very hard to define and that's why the topic, this topic has been debating continuously in ages. As a common sense, leadership is known as a practical skill, including qualities, abilities, and competence to lead groups, organizations as a leader. There are so many elements of leadership that makes it hard to define, such as innovative, acceptance, and decency. And also what people expect for their leader is very different. There are various perspectives about leadership. And I think some people might say boldness is essential for leadership, but other would say deliberation is essential. And for me, I have experienced many roles when I played lacrosse, but I don't mean that I learned leadership just because I was a captain. From many roles I experienced, I can say followership is an element of leadership as well. There might be some people who think followership is the antonym of leadership, but I'd be happy if I can give you the new perspective today. I think the role of a followership is not a simple one. It doesn't just mean following directions or blindly accepting everything a leader said. Good followership is characterized by active participation in the pursuit of organizational goals. In many cases, this means working independently, being accountable for your actions, and taking ownership of necessary tasks. And what do you think? These elements, what I have just said, is exactly what we expect for leaders, isn't it? So when you demonstrate good followership, you're already being a good leader for somebody unintentionally. Your followership is possibly able to motivate your friends or colleagues. That's definitely something we can call leadership. To sum up, I think leadership is the skill to involve others happily. Leaders don't need to pretend to be like a strong because there's nobody who can do everything by themselves. And one key element that attracts and unites people that is the origin of leadership and can't be faked is compassion. The best leaders are not only succeeded at helping others getting through the difficulties or organizations reach new milestones, but they deeply cared for people and never had one-way communications. The important message I'd like to deliver today is that the emotive quality of sympathy, compassion, is the key for the true leadership in common. Thank you. Thanks very much, Yukako-san. You know, as, as entrepreneurs, I think if we look at the next generation entrepreneurs, as we look at the next generation of leaders, I think what you just shared is very important. Well, to lead, you have to first learn what it means to follow. And you know, if you can follow effectively, I think it builds that foundation for you to then move on into the role of leadership. Thank you so much for that sharing. Um, before I continue to uh, Ji Yun, you know, I just want to encourage our participants, if you have any questions, please feel free um, to put it into the chat box, you know, because my co-host Lena is a uh, will be collating the, your questions for the Q&A later. And also, um, you know, there are links that have been put up in the chat box. Feel free to, you know, go into them and to just uh, find out more information about what Iria is doing as well. And of course, you know, do look up our speakers on LinkedIn, connect with them, you know, interact with them. I believe I speak on behalf of our speakers, even for myself, you know, that uh, we are more than happy to share our experiences, share our thoughts, and to also connect with each other, especially in today's world. So I encourage our participants, do that, do that for this afternoon. Let me just then move on to ji -Yun. You know, um, I personally find that the work you do in coded very important because um, in, in making regulations, legislation, something that is easily digestible, that people, the businesses can understand. I think that is so important. So please do share with us a little bit more about your work in coded and also your view, you know, when, when we look at it in the whole ecosystem of entrepreneurship, startups, and innovation, how do you see its importance? 
Over to you, Jillian. Thank you very much. Um, I believe that you know, um, finding information related to legislation that are relevant to your business or anything that you're you know interested in is quite difficult. Um, not only you know, obviously we are working with Korean data at the moment, not only in Korea but many other countries, especially countries with uh, federal system as well as the state level. It is also very difficult to access these information across different states. So the problem we're trying to solve here is not only um, trying to bring all these information into one place, but make sure that you are able to find relevant information, even though you don't know specific keywords to, to look for. So anything that are relevant to your business, for example, you're in the business of uh, media and entertainment, what's happening in those areas and what legislation is changing in the next six months, what regulation is coming up, as well as what do you have to make sure to um, uh, comply in terms of customer protection and so on. There are lots of different um, information you need to search for and constantly monitor. Uh, we make it easy for the companies to do that. Usually um, in a large company, um, even in Korea where there are um, you know, large, large enterprises, there are lots of people working there to manually do this. You know, they collect information on different sites and put it in there and ask questions to people and so on. We believe that a lot of um, places have changed with technology, but not so much in this area yet. I've discovered this while I was working at the OECD as well. When we were looking into policies across different countries, we had to ask countries um, on an Excel sheet what sort of policy changes are happening. And they usually get back to us, you know, um, weeks and weeks later, we have to chase them. And then later when we get it, it's very distilled information. Uh, the only things that they want to highlight and so on, and it's translated. So it's very difficult to get that um, you know, concrete information that we're looking for. So I was wondering about real-time information information that is archivable and also being able to find it easily. So that's how um, we have been working on this and putting that together. So we have um, scrappers and crawlers going around thousand different sites every day, tracking all the information and putting it in one place. And then we use AI to um, customize uh, clients' information and then try to get give them the right information they should be looking at. Um, and also, this, is, uh, this was important because if you're not in the large enterprise and if you're just starting up or, but still there is a lot of regulation happening in your industry, um, you don't have the resources to afford expensive lawyers to look everything for you. Where do you go and how do you find it? You obviously can look into government sites yourself, but you know, it is difficult to find all that information. So that's where we come in. It's much more affordable. And obviously for the company size and if it's a smaller, we, we offer um, much more affordable price and also a lot of things for free for people to get used to looking at this information so that they can prevent any sort of risks that are relevant, uh, that are um, you know, apparent for their businesses that are coming so that they can prepare for the risk that is coming. Or they sometimes get asked, a lot of the entrepreneurs get asked when they are doing a fundraising exercise. Um, investors ask, you know, are you sure that there isn't regulatory risks in your business? Obviously, they Google information a bit and then they sort of say, oh, yeah, I think it's not that bad or there are more just examples. But do, can we really give uh, concrete examples and concrete um, information about what's happening in an easy way? It's difficult. So we help those co uh, companies to uh, prepare better for their investment uh fundraising as well, um, and, and so on. So we have companies from um, small size, like the startups, as well as uh, global companies, um, also using our platform to search for that information and get alerts um, so that they can react fast. We also have information such as politicians, SNS information, what, uh, social media information. So what are they talking about? What are they saying about my company? about certain issues so that they can get early warning about what legislation is going to happen, um, as well as it's so much easier now with our platform to find, um, you know, any serious uh, polit politic hearings and meetings that are happening, you know, there's always recording of it, but it was it was very manually like you have to download PDF of the hearing uh, script 
and search for information. But here we have everything on online to be able to search for the information that you, you need in, immediately. So we've made it easier to um, search for all the necessary information that are relevant. So I feel that in, in and to answer your question about you know, um, how this is actually, how our work is contributing to the environment, you know, all the ecosystem related questions about entrepreneurship, startups and innovation is that when you're doing anything innovative, um, obviously startups are usually doing something in innovative. Entrepreneurs are there to innovate, you know, this uh, world. And there, before innovating anything, you need to know what kind of regulatory issues are there, what kind of policy initiatives are there for you to make use of. Um, because we also have information from policy and uh, information related to what government procurement um, is, is out there so you can find opportunities that are relevant. So I feel that by making it easier and more accessible, uh, we are contributing to that ecosystem and I hope that it will continue to grow and go beyond the Korean data. We are um, looking into gathering more information and the same level of data from um, different parts of Asia, as well as um, other um, parts of the world. So we're looking forward to that as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jim. You know, as an entrepreneur myself, um, you know, I, I personally feel this is a very important part, you know, uh, and you rightly put it, entrepreneurs need to innovate, need to look at things, but also need to ensure that um, they are complying on the legislative regulatory side. You know, um, so as we look beyond then the pandemic, yeah, um, what do you think should be done to in order to be able to foster the next generation of entrepreneurs and innovators? June? Right. So, you know, pandemic has changed a lot of things that were happening, but in a sense, um, you know, startups and innovators for any innovators, it's a, in a sense also a great opportunity to do things differently. And now the world is changing, who can move faster to the changes? Who can adapt to the changes as fast as um, others? And I think that's startups and usually the, the agile groups that can adapt to the changing environment as well as um, events like pandemic. And a lot of new products have gained attention. Um, a lot of new products has also uh, been very helpful in terms of getting through COVID uh, up to now. Even products like Zoom that we're using at the moment, it wasn't as you know, prevalent as bef uh, before pandemic. So as we look beyond um, COVID pandemic, I do feel that the next generation needs to continue to um, innovate in a different way. Um, and the world is a, a lot more connected. People are looking at now, not only your country's situation, but other countries' information. Um, people are connecting. Actually, even though you can't meet on face-to-face, -face, people are connecting more nowadays online and so on. How do you facilitate that kind of um, you know, interactions? So um, looking at the next generation of innovators and entrepreneurs, um, we, I do feel that um, a lot more can be done nowadays, now that a lot of the infrastructure is that there and people are more used to being connected online and so on. Um, new ways of looking at businesses um, and also even policies and how policies can also help the entrepreneurs will change, have been changing already, but will change even further. So I do think that, you know, we have to gather together, gather ideas, always um, discuss about what next we can do as we go beyond, will be an important thing. So, um, and the last thing I wanted to talk about is the next generation of the jet generation, um, the new generation that were born in uh, beyond, uh, after 1996. We work with a lot of them as well. Um, the next really generation has been born with smartphones um, instead of you know mobile. Um, they have mobile now. You know on their as 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 soon as they were born, and we have been discussing a lot about the jet generation and what needs to be changed for them because they are so that they are digital natives they're different um, and i think by bringing them on board in terms of many decisions that are made, made not only in in the businesses but also into the policy areas 
and what、um, new changes are happening is completely different from even the millennial, the earlier、um, generation. So I do feel that、uh, supporting the jet generation and understanding them better, understanding their behaviors better, will also definitely help us to look beyond the pandemic and the business opportunities as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jun. Yes, I think we definitely need to engage at a deeper level the Gen Z. Yeah, whether it's a、um, business or policy level,、um, let me move on to Yukako.、Um, you know, as the planning and coordination manager of Eria,、um, you established this competition, yeah, the Eria YNG Social Impact Idea Competition.、Um, you know, it, it, can you share with us a little bit more about this program? And I guess along the same lines of leadership, why do you think leadership programs are important? Um, and how do they contribute to you know solving challenges? You can go down. Thank you, DJ. Again, so the pandemic has aggravated and accelerated the whole range of threats over the past almost two years, and globalization and economic integration were under tremendous stress. While rising protectionism and self-serving nationalism have risked the region's prosperity and constructive cooperation. So I thought 2021 could be a turning point for us, and we should seize this opportunity to adjust to the disruptions in the post-COVID-19 era. So we needed to focus on complementing each other's economies rather than engage in unhealthy competition. And I felt like we have been witnessing how the crisis encouraged the birth of innovations and ideas. That's why I wanted to create something to be a good opportunity. Especially for young, talented leaders who create the future by their own, and also wanted to take advantage of the new COVID world, which made us connect easily online globally. That's how I established Area YNG Social Impact Idea Competition. So YNG stands for YPO Next Generation, and YPO stands for Young Young President Organization. Which aims to develop the futuristic leaders of private enterprises by connecting young adults with world-class resources and YPO member companies to accelerate their personal and also professional growth. So I believed this could be a good opportunity to support and stimulate the young talents to create new ideas and innovations to address social or economic challenges that we are facing nowadays. While increasing awareness of narrowing gaps in the region and deepening understanding of diversity by sharing everyone's unique background and experience, I honestly valued the process itself more than the outcomes. We formed the teams with a mix of nationalities so that they can learn from others about what's happening in other countries, and they would realize how the cooperation is important to make ASEAN and East Asia a more attractive market and to build inclusive economies with greater participation from members of the society. I do believe that the participants could broaden their horizons through this event. And also by facilitating this event, I actually really enjoyed seeing chemistry between YNG people's leadership as representatives of futurist, futuristic private enterprises, and areas intellectual and analytical research functions. And I'm also very grateful that this attempt made myself grow. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much, Yukako-san. You know what? What you just shared has tied in really nicely with what Jiyun was sharing earlier. In a, in a in a in engaging the next generation, you know, because you engage them to look beyond their domestic borders, to look beyond just you know what are the domestic challenges, but to begin to understand cross culture relationships,、um, and through that to foster, you know, foster innovation, foster ideas that will come forth. Yeah. So, you know, very exciting to hear what what is in store and what are things that you know. Again, to our participants, don't forget post your questions on the chat box. You know,、um, we 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 have our speakers here for a limited time, so make the best use to ask them、um, questions that you may have. I will move back to Adam. You know, in the broader context, Adam, of、um, developing countries like Vietnam. Um, what factors do you think are important to ensure the vibrancy 
of the whole entrepreneurial innovation ecosystems. Adam? Yeah, well, well TJ, I guess I'm, yeah. So I'll, I'm probably gonna repeat a lot what the other speakers have already said, but, um, but maybe just in a different way, okay? So um, if, if I was in an international business context, whether that's international companies looking at coming to Vietnam or a Vietnamese company seeking FDI, you know, the, everyone needs to understand a few things. One, there's a lot of money in the world. There's, it's, it's not a problem getting money. Well, but what the problem is, is finding a good deal, right? And so that, that's that, if you're an SME or a startup, that there's a lot of money in the world that you have to structure it so they want to invest in you. And if that's, that, that, that's the challenge. All right, it's not finding money, it's getting the money. Now, um, so like, uh, you know, the key drivers now and over the longer term um, in all countries is, 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 is at the institutional level, okay? So, you know, the last 10 years in Vietnam alone, you know, um, the institutions have just done a fantastic job. They really have when you think where the country was 20, 30 years ago and where it is now in such a short space of time, if you look at OECD, IMF, or World Bank in indexes, um, the last time I checked, which was a few months ago, I jotted down some figures here. So, you know, the fourth largest country in ASEAN, ease of doing business, number 70. Th that's a critical indicator. It's something everyone asks about. Adoption of innovation and technology, number 26th or 27th in the world. Unbelievably exciting. It really is. You think of the whole world coming in at that for the eagerness to adopt technology, okay? Um, the PPP levels will overtake Brazil in 2025. So a country as resource-rich as Brazil, Vietnam's purchasing price parity is, is soon going to overtake that, okay? Um, logistics performance, third in ASEAN, critical. FTA, showing friendship, the... Um, wanting to work with others, finding a consensus. I think it's 13 bilateral FTAs at the moment, three regionals completed soon. Um, another interesting thing, which I talk about a lot to our companies overseas about Vietnam is workforce participation. 36% is in the service industries. Now, that is a real indicator of development. Okay, if you look at America or Australia or EU, it's services that are drive those economies. And now it's 36% now in Vietnam. Agriculture comes in second and the industrial side comes in third at around 30% of workforce participation. And during all this growth, you know, inflation's been stable at around 3% why per, per capita income and wealth has risen. So with regards to the institutional level, you know, hats off, well done. That, that's a pretty amazing effort in such a short period of time. Now, for startups, so some of the things here, and you know, as you know, TJ, I'm not a startup specialist. I focus on business, which includes startups, okay? So, you know, the national and provincial governments, um, you know, have established at least eight funds that I know of to assist startups and alternative, um, with alternative financing, lower than bank interest rate loans. There's a 52 hectare tech startup center about three kilometers from my house that's gonna be created to create a cluster of excellence. Um, online platforms to connect startups with investors, incubator programs for mentoring, training, equipment access, and R&D grants. So yeah, as in any country, it really does help to have a local partner who has the capabilities to work within the institutional norms and systems to access such support and learning. And, that doesn't matter if it's Vietnam or my home country, Australia, or speakers today, Korea, Korea, Thailand, UK, and so forth. You know, understanding how institutional norms and works, you know, it really does help having someone local. Um, now, a more broader international impact, you know, this, this may require what some of the, what the speakers have already talked about, really. So startups, you know, you need to form clusters of networks of excellence combining the government support programs I've just mentioned with university R&D programs, which has been talked about, 
expanding incubator communities, which uh, Agatha was chatting a bit about in, in the UK, utilizing peer-to-peer -peer platforms for linking local international resource capabilities. You know, these are all available in different stages of development, right? But the challenge for any community, any country, industry, or nation is bringing that together so it, it, it's easily accessible. And that's why I was listening so intently with regards to what, what's happening in Korea with the platform that was just discussed there. It's essential. And anyone who brings that out, God, you, you're, oh, sorry, but yeah, your, your uptake will just be huge. It's just something that every nation needs, right? And um, the areas Australian startups um, ready to go international, if I'm talking to them about Vietnam, it usually includes similar talking points here as in, as in most other countries, such as regulatory reforms and ease to use systems, keeping pace with beneficial startup frameworks for you know, business licensing, international currency transfers and taxation, which is quite tricky in ASEAN, um, IP protection, copyrights, clear timeframes for changes of data privacy and data center laws. That's in every country in the world. Every country in the world is trying to work out a way how to how, how to establish that for, for their, their own national needs, which are very important. You know, and so for vibrancy, I refer back to the importance of community clusters, transferring skills, experience, knowledge, you know, and all of this, you know, at the university and vocational training level, providing workforce skills and RD commercialization programs, which has been chatted about. By previous speakers in the UK and Thailand, you know, really is really an attractive value proposition. Um, and if you're a part of that, you'll find it easier to get investors, without a doubt. Now, um, as in most um, countries in ASEAN, if you can deliver localized solutions, again, especially in the digital economy, then there are opportunities for disruption at scale. And importantly, if your business model can secure revenue streams, you will attract the investment. Showing you can secure rev revenue streams before going for investment and you will have it. Um, the last two or three years, we can see this it, just in Vietnam, uh, in FinTech, e-commerce, industrial retail, residential smart city constructions and enterprise solutions for productivity and waste management and logistics. All, all these types of startups have attracted investment, okay? now. A key consideration may be you can have competitive advantage through innovation or are you going to mimic others? Now, mimic others is fine, but um, an understanding there, if you're going to mimic someone else, then you might need more capital to compete and you might need more capital to be able to drive down prices um, Yeah, over time. so but, but if you have a revenue model, then it's, as I said, it's easier to get capital investment. Um, the startups that upscale quickly are providing localized solutions with modernization. And the larger ones over here tend to have FDI backing from you know, places such as Singapore, Japan, Korea, and the USA. And there's more Vietnamese companies providing that backing as well, which is just fantastic to see. Um, okay, yeah. So yeah. Thanks, thanks so much for sharing, Adam. Yeah, um, you know, it's it's very interesting what, uh, what, what you have shared. And um, I think, Definitely, there are some questions that are probably coming up that would need for you to explain a little bit further later. Um, let me move on now to Agatha. You know, similarly, um, in in your line of work, what do you what what more do you think needs to be done? You know, as we look beyond the pandemic, if you'd like to share your thoughts, please. Yes, uh, great, and thanks everyone for for sharing their thoughts on, on the on what can be done in this uh, in this area. I think uh, I'll link it to some of the things that other panelists have mentioned. Um, I think because of the space we work in, which is at a university level, um, I think it's very important we support the. Uh, generation of new leaders um, because uh, what I think Yukako mentioned, you know, you need to be bold uh, to go and start a company uh, to work on something innovative. Uh, but I think it's also important that you have compassion and that's also something big. And why? Um, 
students we work with um, because of the in-depth of the research, uh, how complex it is, it has massive potential. I mean, it can tackle some of the biggest industry challenges, but world challenges too. Um, so they're not just working, you know, to optimize another platform for, for a corporate. They're actually uh, training, getting trained today to solve tomorrow's problems. And um, those problems are the ones that will only become apparent in three, five years. Um, that's why the deep tech in particular, that, that's the space we're in, um, it's so important to look at now because the potential is just absolutely huge, but it's not an easy place to, to be in to work on a deep tech startup. Um, you know, it's backed by research and IP. It has uh, it has long, um, long impact, long term impact. Um, and as mentioned by Adam, you know, there is money in the world that can support it. Uh, but there is something else that needs to be done. And from my perspective of uh, having worked with many students in, in this space, uh, there's two things. Um, and I think one of them has also been mentioned. Uh, first of all, it's making, um, you know, there's a lot of regulation legislation, making it more accessible and understandable to, to people who are, are working in that space, you know. Uh, when we have a researcher come to us who says, you know, I'm building this algorithm uh, that potentially uh, it can change, uh, I don't know, the, the, the agriculture industry. You know, they often are so green uh, in terms of what are the regulations out there and legislations they need to look at, uh, what to consider before they go and speak to an investor. Um, but to make it more accessible, I think universities and governments have a big role to play. Um, so universities, there is a lot of, they, they're basically a birthplace of innovation. Uh, every student we work with is supported by a supervisor or two, works with other professors um, who, you know, have worked in research for 30, 40 years. It's just incredible the talent that's there at universities. And these are the people we should be really supporting because they are already trying to solve the climate change issues and many other issues that are already around the world and we're experiencing today, uh, but our children are, are going to experience even more. So the governments, universities, how can they um, support students on their journey to, to help solve the big problems? But there is something else as well. It's actually the practicalities of um, starting a startup, because I think it's so easy to say, you know, there's a lot of information out there. Uh, on the internet and it's uh, you know it's the information overload sometimes the more we have it the less we know and what we have seen with our program it's actually the simple um simple information like for example how to interview potential customers how to understand what their needs are before you start building what would you think might solve the problem um it's, it's uh, the basics of finance that are often not being taught, right? What is my, re what's, what's my revenue? What's, what's it going to be? As Adam mentioned, right? And if you can show that you, you're going to have revenue, then you can attract money. But how, how do I get there? Like, how do I build a simple Excel spreadsheet? And what's, what do I need to know as an individual to make sure that my um, projections are, are actually, actually make sense? Um, so what we do in our program, we work with a lot of experts in that area who provide one-on-one -on -one support to students. Um, and I think uh, it's sort of, um, I suppose, to, to solve, uh, solve the, the, the future uh, problems, uh, there is this two, um, twofold, um, uh, not attitude, but I think uh, we need to tackle it from two ends. Uh, there's the grassroots almost and the basics. And then there's also the higher level where we have the governments who can support it. And it's being that, as you mentioned, uh, finding the bridge, something in between that can, can uh, make it happen. Um, so I think for us, uh, just to summarize, um, uh, to, yeah, to tackle uh, the post-pandemic world challenges, uh, we really need to support uh, the talent that comes out of universities. Um, on both the practical level, but also more on the legislation and regulation level. Thank you very much, Agatha. Um, I'm always very happy to hear uh, bridge building initiatives, being a bridge builder myself, you know, um, 
And I think with our speakers here today, there's a lot of synergy that's going on. Yeah, um, very interesting, very interesting. Let me let me move on to to you know Prime Prayer. Um, you know, in the interest of time, I'm gonna ask you really just to also share your thoughts in terms of um, what do you think the pandemic has taught us with respect to the skills that we need to teach to the future generations of innovators. Okay. Thank you very much, TJ, and thank you also uh, other panelists. Um, some of the some of the the skills that I'm going to share here are, are actually in line with what other panelists have already talked about. So we we all agree that the pandemic has definitely changed the world as we know it. Um, the impact on the industry structure and business model has been so large. Our work culture has also changed. Many of us are now working from home, including me, and I think most of you. This webinar is um, an obvious example from the impact of the pandemic. I mean, virtual events had already existed even before the COVID-19, but it wasn't that popular. Right? Uh, we were not so accustomed to the virtual events like this, but now it has really become a norm. We have participants joining in from many countries from different time zones. This wouldn't have been possible in physical events. So there are skills that we are learning and there are skills that we need to teach our future generations of innovators. Uh, after the pandemic. At the same time, the skills that, are, that have been affected by the pandemic have also been affected by technology disruption. There is a shift away from industrial workforce towards digital technology and, and automation. Robots, automation, and digital technology have been utilized more and more in the production process to increase efficiency and productivity. This technology shift is already happening, but COVID-19 is also an important catalyst for the industry to embrace this change even more rapidly. It has been estimated that in about four or five years, there will be 85 million jobs that are replaced by machines. But there will also be, there will also be 97 million new jobs that are added. Um, last year, our office has conducted a survey on high-skilled workforce demands within the strategic industries in Thailand. And the result shows that more than 170,000 high-skilled jobs will be added. And these jobs are, for example, data scientists, crop modeling analysts for agricultural sector, and digital marketing specialists for wellness and high-income tourism. Um, the, the survey result also revealed that multidisciplinary jobs will be in high demand. Most of the future careers after the pandemic will likely be about digital technology, data, and automation. It will, be, it will also be a combination of digital skills and human critical thinking that cannot be replaced by only technology. Um, apart from having specific knowledge and competency for like certain jobs, our future workforce should also possess skills that will help them adapt to whatever challenges that come along. I, um, the World Economic Forum have identified 15 skills for 2025 workforce. I will give you some example. They are analytical thinking and innovation, active learning and learning strategies, complex problem solving, critical thinking, creativity, leadership, um, social influence, technology design, resilience, stress tolerance and flexibility. I think this is a very important part. And reasoning, problem solving and ideation, emotional intelligence, troubleshooting, systems analysis and persuasion and negotiation. Some of these skills are already, just, are already in line with what Akata and Yukako have already mentioned. And as you can see, these skills are actually not something we can easily teach in just sitting in a classroom. They are rather soft skills and also an accumulation of life lessons that educational institutes, family and society can help foster in our future generations. We cannot rely on all teaching and all education to only universities or schools. We as a society are also responsible uh, to foster the soft skills in, our, in, uh, in the next generation. Um, technological change today is more rapid than ever. It makes it harder to precisely forecast which skills requirements are will be needed in the future. Skills that are in high demand today may become obsolete sooner than expected. It means that we have to constantly update our knowledge and skills. And we also have to be an agile learner and open-minded to embrace the changing world. Thank you. Thanks very much, Frank Bria. Uh, 
soft skills will never go out of trend. So for the participants, I think it's a very important thing to take note, as well as lifelong learning. Yeah. Um, thank you, our speakers. You know, thank you for sharing. I will hand the floor over to my co-host Lena right now to, to go into the QA because there have been some questions that our participants have posed. Lena, over to you. Yes, thank you very much, TJ. It's indeed a very insightful discussion. And basically, we have two questions, but the first one is dedicated for Agatha. But let me tweak a bit on these questions uh, to be addressed to the those uh, to Agatha, G Earn, and Adam. Um, because I think this would be useful. So uh, this question is coming from the PhD students, and I do agree that. Um, many people actually having the idea to start the startup, but uh, there is a confusion how to start becoming an entrepreneur or having the startup, uh, startup initiative itself because simply they don't have grounded knowledge in tech. So, in your point of perspective, how to you know how to be solving this problem? So, over to you first, Agatha. Thank you. Yes, um, thank you for the question. Um, well, I think how to start a startup when you're a PhD student. Um, I think, think you have to ask yourself a question, uh, what problem you would like to solve? It goes back to that for as to whether you are a PhD student or, or, or you're not a student, whether you, you know, you're a young person or I don't know, you're, you're older. Uh, what problem would you like to solve? Are you working on a research that you can see an angle in there that uh, could potentially tackle, um, you know, an issue that already exists? Uh, I think that's the first question, uh, because from there you can build, uh, you know, what it is that you need to make that happen. Um, and uh, if you're not part of any program, uh, there are lots of... Um, uh, free programs out there actually that you can join online to start with. I think one of them uh, famous, it's the famous Y Combinator in the US who have a startup school, uh, which is free, um, I believe. It's not just for students, but it's a good starting point. Um, so yeah, I would do that first. Uh, think for yourself, you know, what is the, the, the problem I'd like to work on? Uh, what skills do I have to potentially solve it? And then, then look for free information out there to, to get you started. Um, and give yourself, uh, say, two months or or a month to 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 you know to to get to a, a milestone, and then see where you're at because you don't need to spend two years thinking about that. I think a lot of people spend too much time thinking rather than doing, and and then then find themselves without a, a business or or a solution. Sure, thank you, I get that. So yeah, moving forward, uh, Adam, do you have a word to advise? I would just, um, exactly what um, Agatha just said. So it, it has to be market-led, right? So you're solving a problem for the market, whether that's community-based, business-based, product-based, or, or whatever. You, you, and that people might not know what problems you're solving, but you'll find out with the right research and the right market sort of perspectives that you go in with. And, 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 and then after that, for me, it's research. You have to, if you don't understand everything that's required, then you have to find people to bring into your team. You've got to find a network to work with. And that's why I know, I know a few years ago when incubators started to become trendy and I wasn't a natural fit. I just thought, oh, I don't know about this. I know a lot. I've got good business networks. And then the last three years, I, I really changed my mindset on that all. They're just, it's just fabulous. And there's a lot of free incubator networks out there online. And I'd recommend get involved with them, learn what they do. There's so many specialities involved that you can learn for free. The peer-to-peer -peer network, it, it, it's, it, it's, it's really quite um, exhilarating and the, the learning's fantastic. Yes. Thank you, Adam. I'll make it quick. I'm moving to GN. Yeah, um, you know, I'm not a tech expert. Um, when I first started, um, I 
gradually learn how it works. And obviously I met um, our CTO and the group of you know, tech technicians who can help me build this product when we had the ideas. But I think that um, as a start, there's no need to have all the expertise in technology or anything like that. We're just trying to solve, as um, Adam said, a specific problem that clients are having or customers are having. So basically, um, by researching about them, talking to them and trying to make something very simple. You know, people talk about the MVPs, very small, uh, quick product. And now these people don't even talk about MVPs. They still talk about pre-MVP, something very simple um, to find out whether um, this is the way people want to solve the problem. And then when, we, when you actually have that and see something has been active and showing, um, then you can seek for funding and you know, invest more into technology. And sometimes it can even be dangerous when you have a great tech team in the, you know, in the actual team, then you, before asking anything specifically to the users at, to a very deeper level, you might end up just building it first because you love building anyways, and you love, you, you already can do all these things. And then later on, after like about a year and so, you realize, well, actually people didn't want this. People wanted something else and you have to change everything and all that kind of stuff. So I think by just Fact, the fact that you are in the humanities and you don't yet have the skills of the tech skills, it's actually a great way to find out what people want and what people are um, actually wanting to pay for. So that's going to be uh, something you can just ask, like, would you, we are trying to make something like this, which is very simple MVP. Would you be able to pay for this and how much and so on? You know, you, you discover these things. So I think there will be... Um, a great start and then you go from there and you will learn how things work in this you know i'm still learning as well you're all we're always learning as we go thank you yes thank you Jian. yeah i agree that we are all still learning actually and speaking of learning to be a lifelong learning uh, there is another question emphasized on skills and mindsets i believe that Pran Preya and yukako uh, are talking a lot about this so the question is to be a lifelong learning and having the growth mindset how uh, how do you think to foster those two skills for the future generations uh, I saw Pran Preya uh, show a little smile. Maybe you want to say something over to you, Pran Preya. Yes, of course. Well, as I said before, these skills are actually not something you can just sit and teach in a classroom. It's rather than, it's, 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 it's more like a coaching session. Um, we have incubators, for example, and we also have entrepreneurial program in universities. And within these programs, there are um, business People that they that they, that they started from the start they started from seeding the ideas and then spin off and then commercialization. So I would say through coaching sessions and through talking to your mentors, it can help with positive mindset. Um, regarding lifelong learning, um, it's it's a necessary thing right now. I mean, we cannot really escape technology. So either you learn or or you don't. But I think eventually. Um, this is something that uh, that the next generations they 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 have to embrace. Yeah, yeah. definitely agree. So final stage, Shukako Sam. Yes. Over to you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. I would like to mention about more like a mental thing. So I guess it is maybe generally known, but from my experience, I believe people only glow or succeed effectively only when you are having fun. So if you do something just because you must do or you have to do, you might not be able to get the result you wanted. So for me, I always ask myself whether I am having fun or not. And if I find myself I'm not having fun, I try to find something I can enjoy among the complex tasks. It can be anything, like it can be even a tiny thing to stay, to let you stay in a positive vibe. And also, um, my advice is kind of like trying not to lose myself, being grateful for others' environment and everything, what made you who you are today. That's my advice, to be a positive mindset. Yeah. Thank you very much, Yukako. Thank you very much, Gian, Agatha, Adam, Pranpreya. Myself has learned a lot from these discussions. And throughout all ESI episodes actually. So thank you very much uh, for the insightful discussions. I'm moving forward to Julia. Julia, over to you. 
Yeah. Okay. There's anything you want to add, uh, or should I go now? Please go ahead. I'm good. <laughs> Um, thank you so much. I also learned a lot. Uh, I think we had a fantastic session. It was a perfect uh, conclusion of our uh, uh, webinar series this year because we have touched upon uh, many of the building blocks of entrepreneurship and innovation ecosystems. Uh, we talked about the role of public policy, with Sam Freya, uh, the role of universities, a very important one uh, with Agatha that detailed it very, very well, you know, uh, how they can support uh, uh, want to be entrepreneurs uh, uh, in different locations, in different places, but also the skills that, talk, that uh, we can acquire beyond formal education. Uh, we discussed that with Yukako and also with Frampreya and most of the speakers. This is very important. Some people called it uh, experiential learning. Uh, we need to keep learning, and sometimes this learning really comes from the experiences we are having. And then, I mean, of course, uh, we also learned a lot from uh, the startupers themselves, uh, Ji Young, and also the broader corporate world with Adam. Uh, so we could really uh, talk a little bit about the complexities and also the interactions about these different building blocks. And this is what we have been doing uh, since the beginning of the series. Um, that has been fantastic. Uh, actually, uh, during the series, we had speakers uh, uh, from uh, uh, almost all ASEAN member states and the so-called plus six. So also Australia, New Zealand, Japan, Republic of Korea, China, and India. Uh, and I would like to thank uh, obviously all the speakers of today, but all the speakers that we had uh, from episode number one to episode number 10, I think you can see now a summary. I mean, this is a, you know, a, a collection of all the different flyers uh, of these very different nice colors. Uh, and again, I mean, in case you really uh, missed one, you can always uh, watch the video recording on YouTube, uh, on our YouTube channel. But I also need to thank uh, all participants uh, that have been connecting with us uh, uh, from March uh, uh, to now. We had uh, 2,000 participants throughout the entire series coming from very different locations. The 10 ASEAN member states, also the plus six, uh, again, Australia, New Zealand, uh, Japan, Republic of Korea, China, and India. Uh, but also Europe, from France to the Netherlands, Italy, uh, UK, but also Poland and Switzerland, and also the Americas, uh, North America, like the US, and also Latin America, for instance, Chile. So it was really a privilege to engage with such a broad community of people interested in innovation and entrepreneurship from so many different locations around the world. And now I also need to uh, thank uh, uh, a number of other people that made this uh, webinar series possible. Uh, many other colleagues from area, in particular the communication team, Lydia, Silka, Nadia, Italia, uh, Dega, uh, but also Amelia, Jeremy, Sheila, Alai, Pengui, and Min Min. Thank you so much for your support uh, uh, during this fantastic journey. And also colleagues from uh, uh, ADB Seeds, the Asian Development Bank platform for uh, uh, Southeast Asia, in particular Jason and his team, and colleagues from the UNCTAD E-Trade for All initiative. They have been so supportive in sharing information about this webinar series and also in connecting us with uh, some of the amazing speakers that we had. Um, that was really, really appreciated. And last but certainly not least, to Australian Aid for uh, their support. And then, What's coming up next? Please stay connected. We are going to have a special episode of VSI on the 8th of December uh, to talk more about uh, social entrepreneurship and in particular how this can foster uh, the inclusion of uh, disabled people in our uh, economies and societies. We will share more information about that soon, so please stay tuned. Uh, we are also working on another policy brief to summarize the key findings emerging from this webinar series. Uh, this will be available soon uh, on our website uh, in the next few, few weeks and months. And more in general, lots of new things uh, are coming up, coming up soon. We are working on you know, the next steps uh, uh, in 2022 because ESI will become something more than a webinar series. Uh, but please be patient and we are going to reveal uh, more details uh, very, very soon.
So stay connected, stay tuned, and once again, many thanks to uh, all of our speakers, uh, in particular the one of today, Ji Jung, Yukako, Prampreya, Adam, uh, Agatha. Uh, thank you so much once again. Bye bye. Thank you all. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.